Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and start because um, lunch hour is short um, <laughs> uh, around here, and I know people are going to come keep trickling in as as, uh, um, as classes let out and so forth. So um, welcome. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Trish Mosser. I direct the MPA program in economic policy management here at SEPA, as well as the school's initiative on central banking. Um, uh, I'm very happy to be co-hosting this event with um, the Center on Global Economic Governance here at SEPA, as well as with Columbia Law School. Um, I am really, really pleased to introduce an old friend, Sir Paul Tucker, uh, to discuss his... Use, uh, what's... I know, I know, I'm not allowed. <laughs> but I said... I do it. Americans I do. are so polite. <laughs> Somebody in America asked, well, what do they call you in Britain? I said, you. Yes. <laughs> so, so I did it to annoy you because I knew I'd get that reaction. Um, <laughs> um, uh, to discuss his new, his new book, Global Discord, Values and Power in a Fractured World Order. Paul is a research fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School where he's been since 2013, I think yeah. he reminded me. There yeah. you go. Um, from 2016 to 2021, he was the chair of the <laughs> Systemic Risk Council. And prior to joining um, the Kennedy School, Paul had a long and a distinguished career as a central banker at the Bank of England, uh, where he was deputy governor, uh, both during and after the global financial crisis. And for many years, um, was deeply involved in international and domestic financial policy setting, um, uh, both before the financial crisis and particularly afterwards. Paul, it's all yours. Well, Trish, first of all, thank you very much, and for all of you giving up your time to be here and those watching now or later. And thank you very much to Professors Snyder and Mavridis for giving up their time to engage a bit with this um, book. The, the book has its origins partly in a previous book about the delegation of power to unelected people in constitutional democracies, where a, lo a loose end was, well, even if you can stack that up, which I had a go at doing. What about when they all de when all these unelected people decamp to the IMF or the WTO, or as I did often, Basel, and gather together? Isn't, I mean, I've, that's been described as a conspiracy by people in your Congress, and by people in my parliament. But as soon as you go international, much greater issues um, um, loom into view, which is when you're thinking about domestic delegation and pooling of power and so on you can kind of take the stability of a constitutional democracy for granted. I mean, in practice, one shouldn't for reasons that we've been living through. But once one steps into the international arena, of course, there is no, there's not remotely an equivalent. There is merely some kind of modus vivendi and corporate regimes for cooperation um, among powers and lesser states, always under the umbrella of some kind of security regime, be that um, a balance of power or hegemonic leadership of the kind that our generation has lived um, under. And so the, the question at the heart of the, the book is the tectonic sh um, plates of, of the world order are changing again through the rise of China and China's understandable ambitions. And what will that mean um, for international cooperation in general and in particular for certain particular economic regimes, and how should we think about, about um, that? The, the, the first thing, okay, the first thing to, to, to say is, and I'm gonna make sweeping statements about the book, which are much more carefully articulated, I hope, in the, in the book. I think this is gonna go on for a long century. Um, and the parallel, parallel in the modern world I find most instructive is not um, the Second Reich and the United Kingdom at the end of the 19th century, turn of the 20th century, nor, nor is it really the Thucydides um, fashionable engagement of Athens and, and Sparta. It's, it's France and Britain in the long 18th century from roughly 1689 to 1815. And for Britain, and this is symmetric, but it's, it's helpful to articulate it from, from, from British eyes for reasons that will become clear. For Britain, as, as Burke put it, the problem with France wasn't that Fran France had great power, it was that it was the wrong kind of power from Britain's point of view. 
At the beginning of the 18th century, it was absolutist, ambitious, universal monarchy. And at the end of the 18th century, it was revolutionary um, absolutism. And what this points one towards is that this is not just the standard story of rising states or rival states, that it kind of matters what their deep um, values are. Something else to say about that is what something that runs through the book are four scenarios, a lingering status quo, a superpower struggle, um, some kind of new Cold War, and a new world order. I think when I began writing the book about three and a half years ago, we were somewhere between lingering status quo and superpower struggle. And, and I think that's still true in the monetary arena. I think everywhere else, we're now between superpower struggle and some form of new um, Cold War. Um, the book, with that setting, the book has a high road and a low road, um, or lower road. The high road is um, an attempt to contribute to international political theory and even international relations theory. So caricaturing, and I've me never met Professor Snyder um, before, but caricaturing that discipline, and it's merely for um, effect. Um, there's a moment in any international relations, international political theory scholars' lives where they have to go to a secret meeting and they're allocated either to Hobbes and Hobbesianism or Kant and Kantianism uh, and uh, Grotius and, and Grotianism. And of course, actually, all, all three are instructive. And a further caricature would be that the Hobbes, Hobbesians are interested in power and think it's all about power. The Kantians think it's all about norms and values. And the Grotians um, think it's about interdependence and a rational, deductive approach to that. And the book um, attempts something which I haven't seen it attempted on quite the same, or certainly not quite the same length before, which is to say that David Hume um, Scottish, philosopher, Scottish Enlightenment philosopher has something to contribute to this. And I set out an argument where Hume, and for those interested in political philosophy, book three of the treatise, um, will give an account of why power and interests and norms can't be separated, not just in some superficial sense obvious to policymakers, but in a much deeper sense, that the solution to a lot of collective action ultimately depends on, on norms or fear, and actually norms induce their own kind of, of, of fear. Let me just leave that hanging. I want to say two more concrete things about um, what's awkward in the, in the current world and how the misdesign of regimes can get us into difficulty. The first concerning the trade regime and the second concerning the, the monetary regime. On trade, first of all, I should say a huge thanks to, to Petros and his co-author Andre Sapir in, in Brussels, who were good enough to read the couple of chapters I had, um, I'd written on on trade. And I think it's fair to say you both enriched my thinking, but that I hadn't kind of complete made such horrendous mistakes that you wanted to disengage, um, disengage from me completely. So there is a case, 2013, I think, um, where the WTO has to rule on a subsidies case. Um, that the United States has brought against China. So this is going to be very approximate, Petros. Um, China has their state-owned enterprises subsidizing exports. And the United States says, well, that's not, a, not legal under the WTO, WTO rules. So if you're going to continue with it, we, we need to be allowed um, to, to put in place countervailing measures. Think of that. This is tariffs or other things to kind of raise the price of Chinese um, imports. And China, I think, objects to, to that. And this goes via the dispute panel up to the uh, appellate body. And the appellate body um, has to decide whether Chinese state-owned enterprises are public bodies. And they conclude that they're not. So this is ridiculous. So this is my considered view as someone that spent 33 years as a public servant. This is ridiculous. And it is ridiculous because um, making the analogy again with 18th century France, it's a bit like thinking about French policy during that period and leaving out Louis XIV. I mean, anyone that thinks that the party isn't con in control of what enterprise does, particularly state-owned enterprises, um, do in China, this is no, object no normative objection. This is a dis an objection to a description. Anyone that doesn't get that hasn't engaged with the way that the 
Republic of China has been working. Um, and the problem, of course, is that what do you then do, that view having been reached? Now, in a normal, a domestic kind of situation, right? So, well, the courts reach that decision. That's that case decided. But what's the forward-looking policy? And you'd say, well, we need to change the forward-looking policy in some way. And you'd expect that to be done in some kind of bargaining um, um, mechanism through the powers. But here it matters that there was a huge shift from the gap to the WTO in that everybody in the WTO has a veto. So even if China and, and Beijing and, and Washington went into a room, perhaps with EU and Japan and some others as kind of minor players in the, in the bargaining, in the negotiation, and China said, we'll come back a bit, and America said, we should come back a bit, and then somebody could frame that as a general policy, I wouldn't be able to, Petros would be able to, um, that has no chance of getting through in to becoming general policy. No, inv you know, invisibly close to zero um, of becoming the general policy. So the thing here is that the appellate body becomes the policymaker, a high policymaker. So we have two problems now. We have a problem of tension in substance between rival superpowers, and we have a problem in, I would frame it, the legitimacy of, of the body that is effectively deciding um, high policy. Um, and what the book does is it kind of bridges from the international political theory via some principles for decent pooling and, and delegation of power to say that actually by our own lights, if we are to live by our values, this is not a sustainable system from our point of, from our point of view. The, the other example is of a completely different kind. Um, both Trish and I have been policymakers. We lived and we worked in a period where if you were a monetary financial policymaker, you didn't actually need to know Petros's world of, of, of trade policy. You had to know some trade economics, but you didn't have to know trade policy. And actually, if you bring the trade people and the monetary financial people together, they didn't really need to know anything about security policy um, or environmental policy or human rights policy because the world was siloed. And the world being siloed isn't, I mean, of course, it's convenient to, to all the experts who go around being siloed, technocratic experts and all of that. Um, but actually, this is a gift from order. This is, this is what, this is how the world can live when we don't get up um, every day or every week worrying that what we're doing is actually a move in a much broader game of what kind of world we live in and whether the world is safe, a world where the first question is peaceful coexistence. And at the heart of my book is not only Hume, but a, um, a, a late 20th century, early 21st century moral philosopher, Bernard Williams, who posed the first political question always, domestically in his case, I'm saying internationally, is the question of order and safety and protection <coughs> and trust and conditions of cooperation. And everything else kind of relies on that. And yet the terms on which we accept the answer to the first political question, um, is, is it acceptable to us? Do we want to resist it? Um, and the, the terms that make it acceptable or not are essentially legitimation norms. And we need to live by our legitimation norms because they, in some sense, define who we are. And we, um, in the West, and by the West, I am, we need another word for this, which I haven't found. I am definitely including... Confucian heritage, South Korea and Japan. I'm definitely including democratic um, India. I am including any state that lives by some kind of constitutionalism, some kind of rule of law, some kind of representation. Those are completely different norms than the norms that through a different history have informed um, the People's Republic um, and their system of government. And so it is, I think it is like Britain and France but on an unimaginably grander and greater um, scale. And the book revolves in part around the differences in Chinese history and um, European history and how somehow we have to overcome that. But I think it will take a long time. Thank you, Paul. So I'm really... Um, uh, pleased to be joined by two Columbia faculty uh, members with 
with expertise that really span the really broad topics, as you could tell, uh, in Paul's book. Um, we're going to start off with Professor Jack Schneider, the Robert and Renee Belfort Professor of International Relations. Um, Jack, it's all yours. Thank you. Global discourse is a true tour de force of philosophy, history, and all sorts of nitty gritty pragmatic detail on all the major problems of international economic coordination, uh, even ones that don't happen in Basel, <laughs> as they bear on the question of the future global order. There are penetrating insights into realism and liberalism, um, and uh, especially the English school of uh, international relations, which focuses on the workings of international society. Uh, I just have uh, one addendum to what Paul already said about the schools of thought in uh, academic studies of international relations, which is that some of us like me have been sneaking into more than one secret room. And uh, so I, I typically say that liberals are the best realists and that it's not an accident that the liberal powers have been on the winning side of six out of the last six hegemonic wars in the international system. They are paying attention to, to power as well as to their liberalism. Uh, so, um, conceptually, the linchpin of the book uh, derives from Hume um, and its concept um, is of an international order that emerges from the bottom up. Um, one might even say emerges spontaneously from the bottom up, although, you know, that, that could be putting a word in your mouth. Uh, and also relying on the natural sociability of human nature. Um, which includes the economic dimensions of sociability. Um, the prescription that emerges from the book is for an international order characterized by pluralism based on differences of history and other local differences across the major actors in international relations. Uh, so as, as Paul said, he has not a single prediction for what the future order will look like, but uh, uh, offers up these four different um, scenarios. One is uh, kicking the can down the road of the status quo for a little bit longer with U.S. leadership, but by implication, a lot of headwinds uh, to that. Uh, the second one, uh, which Paul calls superpower struggle, which I might prefer to call superpower hard-nosed competition. Um, third one, Cold War. The fourth one, which is uh, Paul's hope for outcome, is a reshaped order, reshaped along the lines of his uh, pluralistic ideas. So the question that I want to ask is whether... Uh, the key parts of the theoretical structure of the argument of the book uh, support the pluralist uh, reshaped order spontaneously emerging from below through sociability. Uh, so uh, there are, uh, there's first of all the root assumption that. Uh, there's got to be some order that structures the system and makes uh, its systems uh, like fun functional in, uh, in this order. Uh, for the realists, of course, the order is anarchy, uh, where the states are uh, locked in this struggle for security, where war is a possibility at any moment. Um, 
but in uh, Paul's system, um, the order is, uh, emerges in this Humean way through uh, sociability from uh, below. Um, within the, the structure provided by one or another of these kinds of orders, uh, Paul argues that there are components, things that he calls systems, which are, quote, designed regimes framing equilibrium behavior in their fields. So the, the fields would be things like trade, international finance, military alliances, the human rights regime, uh, um, you know, that, that sort of uh, list. Uh, which, as I understand it, these uh, behavior in these systems functions according to some agreed sense of legitimacy, uh, possibly even rules, although I might be, again, putting a word in, in Paul's mouth there. Um, so legitimacy, what would that look like in um, these kinds of systems? Well, an example is um, the three fundamental rules of justice that Paul gets from Hume. Uh, and which seem most directly uh, applicable in the economic sphere. So the first fundamental rule of justice is stability of possession, property rights. The second one is transference by uh, consent. So uh, you uh, agree to economic exchanges, um, which usually has the implication that there's uh, some kind of system of adjudication and authority that uh, can't come in later and either allow you to welch on your uh, consent uh, or to overrule what you're doing. Uh, then the third one is performance of promises. So my question about this as a kind of standard for legitimacy when it comes to rules of justice, you know, even if it's only in the economic sphere, is that, wait, aren't these from liberalism, these three principles? Uh, this sounds like, you know, rule of law as applied to economic exchanges in uh, liberalism. And so if that's going to be the, the, the rules of the road, um, how pluralistic can it be between U.S. and China, where you've just told us that China really isn't a market economy, that uh, the state makes you know all the important investment allocations and can take away your property uh, uh, for all uh, uh, for all purposes, uh, you know, whenever it wants to. So we don't even get to first base with these three fundamental rules of justice in a pluralistic uh, order if we're taking into account history and local difference between the U.S. and uh, China. So just to wrap up, I wanted to uh, make a quick observation about previous pluralistic orders. So one pluralistic order you talk about in the book uh, which is the Cold War Iron Curtain uh, type of order where we had COCOM preventing technology transfer, we had proxy wars in the third world and so forth. And so that's covered under your Cold War hypothetical uh, future. But I I'm thinking about other uh, previous pluralistic orders that uh, did take into account the differences across states, like the Concert of Europe, where you had liberal Britain and sort of liberal France in the same um, uh, international system with autocratic Russia and Austria and transitional Prussia, Germany, where you ha did have great power coordination, uh, but you also had hard-nosed competition based on power and interest, and very importantly, based on the rules of the Concert of Europe. So 
uh, the British Prime Minister, um, uh, Lord Palmerston, uh, had a series of international confrontations with other great powers, first with Russia, then in 1840 with France, where each of them acted against the rules of the concert by using force in a consequential situation, um, one involving the, Tur um, the uh, well, actually, uh, both of them involving the Turkish Straits and who would control, where um, the Russians and then the French tried to unilaterally use force to <laughs> change the regime of how the control of the Turkish Straits would be handled. And Palmerston uh, said, uh, wait a second, that's against the rules. I'm going to use my Navy and my Marines uh, in order to reverse what you're doing because I'm stronger than you are and you broke the rules. Uh, kind of like we just did to Russia. So um, I think, so the Bismarck, you know, did the same thing to Russia after Russia won a war where they were approaching the, the Turkish Straits and uh, announced that they were going to like change the the geopolitics of the entire Balkan Peninsula having won that war. And Bismarck says, well, I'm sorry. We have a, a, a concert of, of Europe here with five great powers, and I have uh, the other three of them are on my side. And it doesn't matter that you won the war. We're going to tell you that, no, we're rolling you back because that's the rules. So I, I think you're on to something here with the idea of an international society that has not just power and interest, but also rules. But the rules can be used um, by, by the people who are powerful, but who also have a legitimate argument about how they're applying the rules. And it's not just to like keep, keep things like cooperative and stable and pluralistic, but it also allows one side to prevail in how it structures uh, the system. And I think as we look forward in um, an international system that has a bunch of liberal powers, but also has Russia and China, we need to think about how to use the rules to actually win. Uh, so uh, thank you. Great book, uh, like fabulous in its reach and depth. It was a, a true pleasure to read it. So um, next up is Petros Mavoidis, the Edwin B. Parker Professor of Foreign and Comparative Law uh, at Columbia Law School. Petros. Thank you very much. And thank you for sharing the book with me, the book chapters. Uh, I can only second the praise. The only problem I had with the book is it finished too soon. I was expecting a little bit more discussion on national security, which I think is the next big yeah, topic I agree with that. Uh, in uh, international relations. So I, what I want to do is discuss a few of the themes of the book. Maybe start. We don't have much time here. I can only speak about trade if I can speak about anything. So my comments are limited to the trade discussion in the book. And I want to discuss a bit the role of the state in the world trading system, which is implicit in, in the book. But not just that, because in my view, we are where we are, not simply because of contract incompleteness or whatever, but also because of domestic issue problems. The rise of populism, which is the first victim, is always international trade and has caused trade disintegration in the last years. And then ask the question that Paul asks, should we go for French sharing from now on or should we go for issue sharing, which is the way we wrote our book with Andre on China. Now, in one sentence, if you go back to the original GATT, there was not much urgency to discuss the role of state. These guys were like-minded players. The GATT is two nations, US and UK. I sat down with an economic historian, Doug Irwin, a few years back. We took the London draft provision by provision to assign property rights to our account for whatever our view is worth. 75 out of 89 is US, UK. So you have two like-minded guys that they write the agreement. Of course, you don't need to say by the way, you should protect property rights. It goes without saying. Now, it was not a bold, it's the best book I've read about the GATT account, it's telling in this respect. Now, this 
But there was an underlying working hypothesis that we're all liberals. No matter what you read from historians like Zeiler to economists, the first chief economist of the God, Tumlir, to political scientists, John Raggi, who was here, the outcome is the same. The idea was, okay, let's do trade, but we trade in a way that will not hamper our decision to protect, to advance social welfare the way we conceive social welfare. But then the God went global. And still there is no change. So why is there no change? Well, because if you look at the identity of the players who joined the GATT, they didn't make change a priority. The GATT incumbents, they bought George Keenan's point that we need to somehow fragment Soviet Soviet power, but they allowed the small guys. They were trolling for minnows. Hungary, Romania, uh, Poland, and uh, Yugoslavia. Now, these guys practically were non-participants in trade, and they lived outside the GATT because they all accepted quantitative targets. They didn't have to live by the GATT rules. So no need to change the GATT. Then comes Japan. When we did with book, the book with Andre, we checked the literature in the 50s and the 60s. My God, I mean, it's like reading about China today. It is almost identical. Everything we say about China, people said about Japan in the 50s and the 60s, with one difference. Japan joined the OECD, and Japan relied on the U.S. from defense to anything. And Japan changed not because of the GATT. Japan changed because of the U.S. and the OECD. Again, no reason to change the GATT. And then we come to <laughs> Paul's discussion of today's world. And now, quite frankly, I don't know if I should share this, our private conversation, but there was a lot of incompetence <laughs> in both sides of the Atlantic in this respect. Oh, I think so. Yeah. Yes, no, absolutely. I mean, it's one thing. I understand the political economy argument that we have to have the first food, first movers advantage in China. I have no problem with that. But I do have a problem with the way we perceive China. China never promised, if we want to be intellectually honest, I will become a market economy in the next five years. Never. Uh, for some reason, this was taken for granted in both sides of the Atlantic. I mean, I can show, we have in the book statements by names are unimportant, big, big, big names in both sides of the Atlantic again. China is on a one way to become a liberal um, market economy and also a liberal democracy. Seriously? So I understand also that it was the negotiation takes place at the worst possible moment, the apex of liberalism. History had ended. We're all on the same page. Maybe they were swayed by that, some politicians. But I see the exact opposite behavior a few years later by the Obama administration. In in TPP, what does Obama do? Well, he negotiates for China without China. What happened in the 90s? We negotiated without China, but not about China. We wrote the subsidies agreement about the EU and the US. We wrote state trading about the EU and the US. Well, problems, of course, would emerge eventually, and that's exactly what happened. And then, of course, I don't want to bother you now with the nature of barriers, but the last point is important. We have now a house with 164 players, heterogeneity at its historical maximum, and by definition, consensus de facto means veto. Nobody uses consensus to consent. I had thought of an example I mean, from the, the GATT when like-minded guys were around the table, the Hubbard report, when in the 50s they put together the who is who of economics, two Nobel Prize economists and some superstar economists and bankers. And they start thinking about the future together. How should we address uh, developing country success? And so in today's world, these things are unthinkable. It took 15 years to negotiate an agreement on customs facilitation. My God. And that's the only agreement that was negotiated from between 95 and today. So where do we go from here? And I will stop with this. Undeniably, free trade areas now, they are the, the game in town. They run away with the agenda. There's a World Bank study 2020. They make a very rough distinction, thin, thick borders. Thick borders is MFN trade. Thin borders is preferential trade. This is all the regulatory agenda in FTAs outside the WTO. So the choice we have is French shoring or issue share. And, I, and I'm not a big fan of French shoring because I think only diamonds are forever. Friends keep changing. 
Yesterday's <laughs> enemies are today's friends, and God knows who will be our friends tomorrow. And I like very much, and I have a lot of sympathy for what you said, probably because I'm half Indian myself, when you put India and uh, my wife is from India. Uh, India and in the, in the camp, I think we should not keep it to our friends. We should try to look for alliance. I think it's the duty of stakeholders. Bob Zellick in this great book, speaking about how China should behave as a responsible stakeholder and how we can entice China. China has a strong interest to be part of the WTO. It's an export-led growth model. It made its money through the WTO, not by looking into the demand in China. And we cannot just let it go simply because we disagree in three or four areas. And China, by the way, was knocking on the door of the TPP recently. The US left with the Trump administration, and China knocked on the door, so I want to be part. And TPP has the first best discipline of state trading and subsidies for China done without China by the Barack administration. So I think there is room to discuss. I totally agree with you that they should remove cases from the docket. There should be much less judicial activity in the WTO. These guys, they don't understand the agency costs. They don't understand how difficult it is to undo a bad WTO decision. If something goes wrong in England, we have a new law in England, and we preempt judicial discretion. Yeah. How do we do these things in the WTO with 164? I totally agree there should be much, much less digital activity. And in my view, for whatever my view is worth, issue sharing means one thing in the WTO, bring back the Tokyo round and variable geometry. Bring back the possibility for like-minded players to go ahead and sign agreements. It doesn't make any sense to pretend that we should be going by consensus. Consensus maybe was a momentary lapse of reason in the early 90s, but that's about it. I think it, is, it has expired. And the only way we can go back to the legislative negotiating table is through issue sharing. Thank you very much for the book. So thank you, Petros. So, <laughs> so, so, now, so now it's my turn. And I'm, nobody in this room is going to be surprised that um, I'm going to focus on the la what is mostly in the last part of this book on applications, particularly those that have to do with the international monetary and financial system. Um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of meat there, but I'm, I'm going to start with a question that the book poses, and then um, and go from there. Um, why isn't the international financial monetary coordination cooperation mechanisms? I'm going to use the word Basel as Paul does in, in the book. Why are why isn't that process so more strained? Trade is strained, to put it politely. You can just listen to what Petrus has been saying. Um, think about the international negotiations about climate change. Good God, if there's a commons problem and we, there can't, we can't seem to get to any agreement about it. Um, the book includes some examples from the World Health Organization, human rights examples. Um, all of those are much more tortured international negotiations than what happens in international money and finance in the Basel process. Why is that? Um, the book does provide some insights on this topic for certain, uh, and along the way, it's surprisingly positive. Um, I'm looking at Paul and smiling uh, uh, about the Basel soft law processes um, in terms of making at least some progress over the years on international policy issues. I want to point out how incredibly imperfect they are. The book also says that too, as Paul perfectly well knows, and I both well know, it's very far from perfect. But it's made a lot more progress than the WTO, let me put it that way. Um, and the, as I said, the book does offer some, some explanations and insights about the, why the, the sort of soft law approach of Basel has been moderately successful. Part of it is a question of, of, of culture. Part of it is a shared risks. International finance is, is, is inherently fragile and the spillovers hit everybody at the same time. Um, it's kind of technical and complicated too, um, which also leads to um, it being appearing much uh, appearing quite secretive, they don't do themselves any favor. But but surely surely it has to be to be more than that as to why it's quote a bit more successful. Now I have a hypothesis about this. I didn't see it explicitly in the book, but it borrows from your earlier book. Um, and the fact of the matter is, the vast majority of the institutions that sit around the table in Basel, central banks, regulatory agencies for the most part, are agencies that have delegated authority. Um, to um, delegated authority domestically 
um, by their governments. And delegated authority seems very important um, about how work not only is done at home, which Paul's book, previous book was very much about, but how those institutions interact with their peers internationally. Specifically, it can help explain why learning from each other about better ways to execute delegated authorities is completely logical for them to do. And how that can lead in certain circumstances, particularly with respect to international financial regulation, to a set of international minimum standards that everybody agrees to go back home and get their legislators, legislators to, um, to endorse. But the learning part of that happens. Um, and, and frankly, central banks and regulators are kind of incentivized to do that learning, even, even in the absence of a formal standard setting process. And let me give a really explicit example here um, that is not soft law international coordination at all. And that's monetary policy frameworks, specifically using inflation targeting frameworks to set monetary policy goals um, uh, or instrument goals in the short run. The fact of the matter is, and it's in less than 15 years, less than 12 years actually, um, the number of central banks in the world who used inflation targeting to set monetary policy went from zero to 95% in 12 years. Now that was not an international standard that was agreed to ex ante. Some agreement about it ex post, but it wasn't, certainly was never sent as, as a, yeah. Um, uh, so it's not like bank regulation, it's not like payments policy, it's not like market regulation. Central banks just did it. Uh, and it seems to me that only institutions who had delegated authority, had this sort of what we call instrument independence uh, to pursue, the, to pursue their, their goals, and you have to have legitimacy obviously to do this, could pull that sort of effort off. I think the international standard settings part of it is just the step two in that process. Um, uh, yeah. uh, and if, so if I had, had wished for a, little, for a little bit more, it, yeah. would, it, it yeah. would have been that connection. Uh, a second issue, but on the same point, one area where international cooperation has been strained uh, in international money and finance, as the book rightly points out and is completely correct, is on crisis management. A lot of the things on international regulatory design, and, or minimum, standard setting, excuse me, is what I, what I meant to say, um, sets, set minimums for um, ex ante behavior, regulations to help make the system more robust. Uh, but the la and the lack of international standards for what you actually do when the crisis comes anyway is really a pretty bad failure and frankly, it's a dangerous one. But the, the question for this book is why is, it, is that a failure? What is that, why has that part of it been, uh, of the policy uh, standard setting process been more of a failure? Well, I'm again going to go back to delegated authority. It's really hard for central banks and regulators to say, oh yeah, we, we know we can use taxpayer money to bail out institutions or to lend to distressed institutions, domestically and even worse, foreign. That is, that's fundamentally a fiscal and a political decision. And it's very difficult for delegated authorities to do that. It, um, and it puts, I think, the, the international conversations about those policies it puts them back much closer to the world that you're in when you're trying to negotiate things within tra about trade or climate or uh, or anything else. I have I have I have um, two more comments. Uh, one is about the central bank swap lines. I can't resist um, since Paul knows this is a topic that I know a little bit about. Um, Central bank swap lines obviously have international relations as well as um, international economic uh, uh, implications. And I, and I want to be real clear here that the swap lines always, always have had international relations political angles um, and not been just about economic policy. But um, that was true back in the old days when swap lines were about foreign exchange intervention and it's cer certainly true of modern central bank swap lines which are about liquidity provision. The structure of the contracts, the choice of the countries that have access has always been a balancing act. Um, and as an example, there's a very interesting staff memo to the FOMC um, from either October or November of 2008, I'm not quite sure uh, which month, 
That was when the swap lines were expanded during the global financial crisis. And in that memo, there is analysis of exactly the mi a mix of different factors and a set of recommendations about which countries should be added to. Um. Now, the mix of factors was tilted toward economic and financial factors in those countries and some policy, but absolutely the political relationships mattered as well. Um, there were certain countries that were just not on the list, period, full stop, no matter what the economic and financial conditions said. Um, like the book, I think this could change pretty significantly in the future. But if it does, for example, we get into this superpower struggle or new Cold War, um, and swap lines become mainly a political decision as opposed to based on economic and financial factors, it will pose a really, really deep challenge to central banks to stay within their mandates. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if you'd like to stay within the guardrails of what they've been delegated to do. If it becomes overtly political, then it belongs in the Treasury Department, the Finance Ministry, wherever. Um, it also then becomes directly costly to the taxpayer, which is a completely different story from the way it's run right now. <laughs> One last comment. I was glad to see the book tackle the dominant currency U.S. dollar issue so very directly um, and uh, how this is increasingly going to be a political issue as time goes by. Um, I was a little surprised that the book didn't present an even more pessimistic scenario, um, frankly, on this topic. Um, in over 400 years, actually more than 450 years, I think, there are only three examples of truly dominant global currencies. Truly dominant, single dominant currencies. The Dutch florin, the British pound, and of course, um, since the Second World War, the US dollar. The fact of the matter is that the first two of those episodes ended in truly, truly ugly fashion. Much uglier than any scenario that is in this book. Multiple world wars, depressions that went on for decades. Um, I'd like very much to believe that Barry Eichen Green is right, <laughs> a historian from Berkeley, for those of you who don't know who he is, um, that we can shift from the current status quo to a multipolar currency world in a less dramatic fashion than those two historical episodes. And you never base, I'm, a, I'm an empiricist, you never base too much on two data points, but we just don't have any more data points, thank goodness. Um, but the fact of the matter is that history is not particularly encouraging on this point. And so figuring out how to do that is a really major international global challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Do you want to go to audience? Do you want to go to audience questions or do you want me to respond a bit or what do you want to happen now? Well, why don't you respond a little bit first and then we'll open it up. Okay. Um, so when Professor Snyder talked about the Turkish Straits, it's a reminder that the geography of the world doesn't change much. So anyone that's been following the war in and on Ukraine will have known about what's been going on in the Bosphorus and the Turkish Straits and the question about whether grain ships could come through. And anyone that's been lucky to sit at the Bosphorus, as I have, in wonderful fish restaurants and watch the Russian Navy pass through, is reminded that some things don't change. So less obvious would be, um, this is about India. I think the most important thing that happened in 2020, I thought so at the time, was not COVID. It was the skirmishes between China and India on the borders of India as China um, went in again to try and expand, kind of take a few more um, meters. I thought that was of extraordinary importance and actually was bit of an unforced error by the Chinese in terms of tilting how different current and prospective great powers um, feel about each other. And the re-emergence of the Quad in the Pacific, which India is central, is hugely important. And this has a bearing on your former world and mine, in that there was a moment during the financial crisis, I think this is the first sentence of the preface, Someone walks into my office, I think I'm the deputy governor at this point, and they say, the Fed's just refused India a swap line. It doesn't matter what swap lines are, India wanted one. And my response is, don't they realize India's going to be a power? <laughs> and what my feeling about that was, above Bernanke's pay grade. 
Um, and actually, I disagree that it's for the Treasury Department, it's for the President and the State Department and the National Security Advisor, because it's how are, are India, have we explained this in a way to India where they're not going to be, you know, really, really fed up? And for all of the unforced mistakes that the West have made, so far it seems that China is kind of trumping them, to use an expression, on a kind of grander scale, refusing a swap line is not quite as bad as trying to take um, territory. That's the first thing to say. Second thing I remark I make on what Trish said is this business of whatever inflation targeting is, it emerged organically. And the US was, relatively speaking, slow to the game. Very, very slow. And it really, really mattered that this wasn't led by the hegemon. And actually, it also mattered that I think this was good in the sense that because the Federal Reserve is the most important monetary authority in the world, it shouldn't be experimenting. It should be kind of seeing whether it works. And so there are some moments in global leadership for following rather than for leading. And that was a great example of the Fed kind of um, following. Then bridging again monetary to security and to trade. Petros uh, mentioned all the anxiety about Japan and trade and the economy as they kind of rose. There was a parallel one in the monetary sphere, which was, will the yen rival the dollar? Will the Deutschmark rival the dollar? Record of German inflation since the Second World War, both when under the Bundesbank and the European Central Bank since it was the euro, just in terms of inf volatility and level of inflation, much better than the Federal Reserve. The key thing is, actually, um, neither Tokyo nor Paris, Berlin, Brussels try to displace the dollar. Why? Ultimately, because we live under um, a US security umbrella, which has worked out fantastically well for, for Europe. Um, China will naturally want it, the renminbi to be an international currency. It is not remotely under the US security umbrella. And so monetary affairs and, and security affairs are going to become linked in way, intertwined in ways that made sense to Paul Volcker and I think who just haven't needed to be part of the mental um, apparatus of Paul Volcker's um, successes. Um, I want to bridge, and I'm, I'm leading up to the big question about pluralism. Um, I want to bridge to that by saying something about, Petros was, is so polite and says, is it okay to say that actually they messed <laughs> up in the 90s? It was utterly, in, look, utterly incompetent. So a principle that runs through the book is, is what economists call robustness, which means um, when the stakes are high, try to pursue a course that will minimize the maximum costs of bad, bad things happening. So bad things happening, how do I crush? We can't control that always, the probability of them happening. How do we minimize the maximum cost that could come from, from that? Another way of thinking about this, um, going back to Thucydides, who certainly didn't have the word minimax, was avoid wishful thinking. By the way, for those of you that do IR, um, it is not true that Thucydides actually said avoid wishful thinking, <laughs> but, the, but, the, but the spirit of it is, is, is um, in there. Beware of who you read on Thucydides. And if you don't read ancient Greek, which I don't, find a friend who does. Um, <laughs> and they're normally very interesting people. So there's economic liberalization in um, following Deng Xiaoping. That's an absolutely marvelous thing. And obviously, it was, it was certainly possible that that would lead to political liberalization. I personally didn't think it would. I lived in Hong Kong for a while. I know something about the party. But I think that was a completely reasonable thought. The question is not, might this lead to political liberalization? It's, it was, would you want to put all your chips on that? All of them. Of course you wouldn't want to put all your chips on that. I cannot imagine the meetings where somebody doesn't say, isn't this a, a reckless policy course? I'm being completely serious. I cannot imagine what those meetings were like, that no one feels they can say that, and it's even worse if they didn't think it. Although one can have debate about which of those is, uh, is worse. Um, I think Petros's um, comments about variable geometry in international regimes kind of bridge to the question about pluralism. The, the, 
the conception of the world I have, which for what it's worth is, is developed in chapter 13 of the book, which is kind of the core chapter, is that this is perspectival, if I'm saying that correctly. We're going to live in a world of concentric legitimation circles. In the outer, right out there, is the thinnest possible society where we aspire for peaceful, peaceful existence. Um, we can't push other powers completely beyond the pale. But we, but we need somehow to be prepared, I agree, to prepare the, the, the conventions and rules of the game of peaceful existence. Where I see pluralism coming in is that as you, the, the way I think of it is, you can cooperate with people more deeply, the, the less you fear them and, and the more you have in common with them. And having com common things isn't, isn't kind of how you look, it's kind of what you think and how you, how your institutions are constructed. And so we will be able to cooperate more with people that have more in common with us. I hope that um, for Europe, I hope very much that that will be India. Obviously, it will be the United States. But some, something along those lines will be going on in Southeast Asia as, um, as well. And I think the pluralism is that there'll be other systems of concentric circles um, with, an, with, with alternative um, epicenters. But the key thing um, is that in that outer circle is the thinnest possible society of conventions and norms of peaceful coexistence. And I, I don't know whether I argue this clearly enough, to be frank, but I, I think Professor Snyder is completely right. On that, you have to be, I mean, the tone of this is towards the end of the book, you have to be prepared to sacrifice yourself, which is easy for me to say age 64. Um, but, but there will be calls for sacrifice. There is no doubt um, for, about that in my mind. And that's, an, that's an extraordinary change in the world I was able to be um, an adult in. So I think the stakes are going to be enormously high. And, and all the time, this isn't just about China, but all the time we should be remembering this is not about Chinese people. So the book ends with a different story. Is I'm sitting in Hong Kong and... On a nearby table, there are three Cantonese women having a business meeting. And the, the, I lived in Hong Kong, and the kind of rhythms of Cantonese business life could not be closer to the rhythms of London business life. Trading, it's much more. Hong Kong Cantonese have got much more in common with London merchants than London merchants have with, with US merchants. And I looked across, and I'm kind of scribbling something, and I think, this is us. And it is us, and this is human commercial society, but it works in slow motion. And commercial society doesn't guarantee peace, which Germany and Britain discovered a century ago. So we can be optimistic that commerce will push us together in the very long run, but we have to be absolutely realistic, um, and you will have to be prepared for sacrifice in terms of how we get there. Thank you. So if Paul's willing to stay, I think, and, and folks don't have to go to class. I know there's people putting on coats, et cetera. Yeah. We've got time for a few questions. Everyone's going to class. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> going to class. No questions from anybody? Right over here. Ah, please. <laughs> That's fine. There's a, there's, a, there, there's a mic coming. Just a second. I mean, my mom says that I'm very loud, so. Yeah, that's good. Oh, could um, you mind identifying yourself? Oh, uh, hello. I'm Khan. Um, I'm actually from NYU. I study finance and sustainable business with minors in law and mathematics. Um, I am a 2022 Law and Society Fellow, which means that I do research on procedural justice, which is like saying I like to walk around in minefields where I have no map whatsoever. Um, this is very much outside of my usual arena of study, as you can imagine. Um, but I was very curious about it, and so I wanted to ask, since we've had this growing trend of, of federal, um, of, of central banks being given greater degrees of liberty with monetary policy and dealing with inflation, um, kind of as a means of perhaps making, at least as the Wall Street Journal says, less political in order to maybe avoid um, taking the blame or being in the middle of fire, so to speak. Um, what do you think of this? Do you ever think it's going to be less political in nature? 
or is that simply just a way of transferring it on paper? Will the discourse be the I same? Think, so this is not the subject of this book, subject of the previous one. I think the Federal Reserve, the European Central Bank, the Bank of England, floating, flirting with climate change and social justice has landed um, avoidable inflation um, on the American people and the European people and is going to lead to shadow banking blowing up and inflicting more pain on them. And the thing about being unelected is accept the terms of the mandate you've been given um, and not try to seek more. Do the job that only you can do. And don't, even if you think the elected government is useless, don't think that you can substitute for it because voting is more important than monetary policy. <laughs> yes, yes, please, right here. Oh, thank you, Jack. Someone else who has to go to class. <laughs> thank you. Steve Cargman, I'm a lawyer. I work in the international area, especially the emerging markets. Um, does the West expect too much of China when it expects China to play by the rules that the West established uh, post-war? And uh, may this be the reason that China is establishing its own international institutions like the AIIB and Belt and Road Initiative, so on and so forth? I think the answer is a yes and yes. And there's a moment where a kind of pluralistic liberalism that was embedded, for example, in the GATT, shifts towards a kind of universalist liberalism, which I think it was a Kantian type liberalism, which we've had a deep think and we know the, the answer. Um, and kind of what connects my kind of policy feelings about that to my kind of slightly higher level feelings is that a kind of Humean liberalism accepts that the, ha the norms that we've got reflect the particular um, opportunities and problems that we have faced on our paths through history. <laughs> we should reflect on them, of course, otherwise they could be bad norms, but we should accept that other peoples, other civilizations have traveled through history in different ways um, and arrived in different places and that their norms and values too can be, um, um, can be valid and are valid to, to them. And we kind of, we should be respectful of that while being realistic about whether how they want to travel through the world is a threat to a way of life that we um, value. So I think the, 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 since this goes back to Petros and I saying, well, the WTO wasn't designed very well. And I mean, I said what I think about that as a policymaker, which is I think he was incompetent, um, as a kind of in a higher level way, I think it kind of reflected a conceit that has come about in the West as a certain type of Kantian philosophy has become more deeply embedded um, in not only scholarly life more generally, which is that we've arrived, we've, we've, we've kind of got the answer. I think that's an extraordinary um, conceit. And I, I think to that extent, I think a, a kind of Humean liberalism is, is, is more modest in its, its intellectual claims. You know, remember that some of the virtue ethics in Aristotle are kind of, are, are in, one wouldn't call them virtue ethics, but the same sentiments and almost the thought, same thought experiments about the child falling down the well are in um, the works of the people we call Mencius um, and kind of echo and at a kind of more abstract level in Confucius. Anybody else? Wonderful. Oh, please. So um, you said that it used to be so environmental policy, trade policy and everything is in different silos and that now everything has become much more intertwined. And you, for instance, you say that monetary and security policy will become more intertwined in the future. So what I'm wondering is, Will that make it easier or harder to reach international agreements in the future if you politicize everything in that way? Harder. Harder. Um, the, in, in the climate um, policy, a proposal made by um, Nordhaus, Nobel Nord Prize winning economist, is, is that we should try to incentivize 
people to um, comply with climate change treaties by, if you don't um, comply with it, well, then there'll be higher tariffs in terms of trade. So in a game theoretic sense, you embed the climate gain and a trade game. And the difficulty with this is that the trade game is embedded in the security game. So imagine, imagine, imagine our countries um, apply all the climate treaties, which is not true, but just so imagine it's, it's true. And then we say, oh, we're going to put tariffs on China, really high tariffs on China or on, on India, say. Well, in one case, we'll fear really big reprisals from, from China, meaning material reprisals around Taiwan. And the other will, will say, well, we're just about to alienate India and we need them. You know, we'd like China to be our friend and we'd like to be their friend. But we at least need to keep India um, and our friend. And the, and the most grown up person in the room says, we're not doing this. We're not going to do this. So it makes it much harder. Yes. I mean, my feeling about the climate stuff, what it's worth, is that, um, let me say, a thing that will sound frivolous, but is, is meant to just bring issues together, which is imagine that fighting climate change is really costly for both China and the United States, and that you and I are advising Leader Xi on that. And we put a note up and we say, we really think you ought to do this, that, and the other. And, and he says, how much is it going to cost? And you and I are for a number in Renminbi. And he, he turns to somebody and he says, how many aircraft carriers is that? And you know, the unit of counting would be aircraft carriers. I mean, it would be crazy if he didn't think partly in those, um, in those terms. And, and so I, I fear that the joined up action of the really big countries, the United States, China, India, the EU, will be, we'll have to get even closer to disaster where we feel, oh my God, uh, we care about continuing to exist more than we care about our um, rivalries. So, I, no, I don't. I hope I'm. I really hope I'm wrong about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One Hi, thank you so much. I'm Jiaxuan Lei Lili, a Chinese student studying the MPA program. I'm really intrigued by this truly interdisciplinary panel and um, Professor Moss's comment that um, Basel-style soft law is might be easier to propagate than other areas. Then what can be done to use lessons from Basel or um, such mechanism to other areas? Can I offer an answer to that? I'm sorry, I think, I think Trish is right what she says about that. And it has two advantages. One is, I mean, these are, first thing I'm going to say, completely true stories. Someone, the US Congress, someone from the European Parliament um, attacking me, not personally, we were friends, um, about, you know, Basel ruling the world. And I said, Basel, it, it, all of these things have to be tr translated into hard law domestically. Via, domestically. What do you mean? You choose whether to comply. So I think that's, that's more the theme of my previous book. This one, I think it matters... And this is awkward in that in the, in the, not only in the WTO, but in the securities markets field, world of the SEC and so on, they meet internationally at a thing called IOSCO. There are hundreds of members. Everyone has a vote. Basel is like a series of concentric circles. The center of it is something, it used to be the G10, now it's called the ECC. China sits there with India and Mexico and Brazil maybe Korea now, I don't know. And actually, that's, that's the call. I sat in that group, mainly at the back row, but I sometimes in the front row because I chaired the committee. And then there's a slightly bigger meeting called the Global Economy Meeting. This is in chapter 19 of my book. And then there's a kind of bigger circle still. And the, outer, the, out, the middle circle and the outer circles have to feel that the inner circle isn't just going to pursue their interests as the big countries in banking. This isn't West or East, the big countries in banking. And that means that you have to be very careful only to pursue the things that you think really do matter to international stability. And then say, I feel very strongly about this next bit, but everybody else doesn't need to comply with it. And a mistake the IMF and World Bank make is they say, well, Basel Standard, everyone should comply with this. Every Ethiopia and, I don't know, the Philippines and, and Venezuela. I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, the standard is about international banking stability, and Venezuela and the Philippines and Ethiopia are countries that matter. 
um, and their people most certainly matter, but they don't matter very much to international banking stability. So why should they have to comply with a standard that I helped write? So I, and I think then the question, and I don't know the answer to this question, is how far is that transferable to other fields? It plainly isn't easily transferable to trade. Maybe it's transferable to climate because it, you know, all that matters to climate really are the big polluters. It doesn't matter what small countries do because they're small. It happened to trade critical mass agreements. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I, I, agree, I agree with what, what Paul said. One, one other comment. The, the point I made about central banks and regulators having delegated authority domestically to sort of pursue a set of a very narrow set of policy goals and to have a fair amount of independence separate from the legislature and the executive branch about how they do that um, makes it easier for them to enter into this. So they still have to go home and convince for any kind of major change and convince their legislature to pass a law that is something that's consistent with the Basel standard. Um, but in terms of an awful lot of this, um, it does make it easier for them. That's very difficult. No trade representative that I know has delegated authority of that way that they could enter into a set of, um, they could certainly have plenty of conversations but um, the idea that they have delegated authority domestically to implement any of those things is basically not the case. And I think that makes it hard. Sorry, yes, one more question, please. Hello, um, my name's Monica. I'm a visiting PhD student at SEPA this semester. Um, I have a bit of a speculative question, um, but I think what you were saying when we were talking about inflation targeting, about how it's harder for the U.S. to experiment when you're the leader, um, I think like clearly um, U.S. hegemony or the hegemony of the U.S. dollar is deeply entrenched in the global financial system. But I guess more from an IR perspective, does that kind of put the U.S. at risk if it can't um, experiment as much kind of for its position on the on the global stage? Oh, that's a really interesting question. In a way, I think the US should want others to experiment so that it can, um, um, so that it can learn from what others do. This is, the, the topical example would be digital currency. Yeah. I, I would, if power in the room, I say, don't go first, um, because one, I think they'll screw it up. Exactly. The reason I think they'll screw it up is because they rarely go first and experiment, I really don't think they're very good at going first. There is something they did go first at over the past few years, and I thought it was kind of B minus, but beta minus, gamma plus kind of stuff. I think they're not programmed um, to do that, as well as the stakes being um, higher. Um, but obviously, I think there'll be a kind of digital currency race, ultimately, between the dollar and the renminbi. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that China faced far fewer kind of constraints um, in doing that than the, than the US. Um, so this will be, this, this will be difficult. I, I have less confidence that the Federal Reserve understands itself than I did when I was a young man. So I completely agree that the Fed will be late to the party on this. They almost always are for exactly the reasons that you say. The stakes not only for the United States itself, but, but the international stakes here are massively high. On the digital currency side, one of the big, big, big questions is, unanswered questions, is international interoperability. You gotta remember most of the paper currency, right? Right now, most dollars are held outside the United States. Way more dollars are held elsewhere in the world than are held here. And so um, the idea that a digital currency under the status quo wouldn't be the same thing. So you would better figure out international interoperability if you don't want to create more turmoil for yourself and for everybody else. So um, I agree they're probably not very good at it because they never do it. But <laughs> I also think it's completely, it's completely the right ordering, yeah. um, not only for the U.S. and the Fed, but frankly for, for just financial stability um, generally. But for, for those of you that don't know, inflation targeting began in New Zealand. Yes. I mean, this is yes. kind of, and it, and it gradually swept the world, New Zealand. Yeah, sorry. 
New Zealand, New Zealand and the and the Swedes. They're they're all also on their experiment yeah. first in monetary policy anyway. Okay. All right, great. Thank you all. Um, oh, you have one. Oh, we have one more. That's fine. Can you stay? Yes. You're good. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Steve. I'm currently a first year MPA student here at SIPA. So my question is about consistency in foreign policy in uh, liberal democracies now. When I look at China, I think one of the few comparative advantage for China to sort of establish these international organizations is that uh, foreign policy is sort of consistent for China. We see AIIB, the BRI, uh, the investment is dropping, but it's still there. And when we look at the um, RCEP compared to the IPEF, we wonder if the IPEF would be the next TPP that the U.S. would just withdraw off as the next president. So I'm just wondering, uh, how big is this challenge for liberal democracy in the next one decade or two? And how should we really figure this out? I'm so pleased you asked that question. It's because um, it's another, another kind of um, thread in, in my book. So, so I think one advantage that liberal democracies have is they're quite good at error correction which is the flip side of what you're saying, which is travel a long time, you make some mistakes, oh my goodness, vote that lot out, have the other lot in. And it might not really be ideological, it may just, maybe just be a competence thing or bad luck. But through that mechanism, you, you, you change course when you need to. And the flip side, I'm deliberately sending it away, because the flip side of that is, but can you stick to a, a tolerably good call, um, um, course when the party in power is changing all the time. And there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that the domestic dislocation in the United States, and to some extent in, in parts of Europe, certainly in my own country, much less so in the EU, is a problem in that regard. The EU um, is incredibly good at sticking to a constant um, um, path. It, it's very... There's a, there's a book, it may actually be someone here, Anu Bradford. Is Anu Bradford here? Excellent. Okay. She read a book about the EU as the, the regulatory superpower, and it is the regulatory superpower. Um, and one of the reasons it is, is that every five years, there's a big change, but actually the strategy remains much the, the, the same. But I, I think this is a, you know, to the extent that the West even aspires for it to maintain its way of life, its main priority needs to be um, internal. And you know, here, um, don't put obstacles in the way of people voting, count the votes, announce the vote, results, um, abide by them. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's not hard. Great, wonderful. Thank you all for coming and staying. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks very much.